My name is Shannon Truex. I'm the owner of Bone Shaker Boxes. I've been creating steampunk altered history boxes for about five years. Uh, be prior to that, I didn't even know any of this stuff existed. I'd never been to a con, I had never been to any kind of a steampunk or any other sci-fi convention, had no idea. But I love working with wood. So I built a box that was based on a Tim Holtz design that sold in scrapbooking stores. And they made it out of cardboard and they were selling it for $65. And I told my wife, I said, I can build that out of wood. It'll be much better, stronger, like the $6 million van. So I made it, she took it to work and showed it to some friends and they mentioned the word steampunk. Obviously I'd never heard of it, so I quickly Googled it and from 100 miles from my house, she could have heard the sucking sound of me being drawn into it. I absolutely fell in love with it. So I was able to take two of my loves, and that's history and woodworking, and combine them. So if any of you have seen any of my boxes, you know that I try to be as functional as possible. This is a T for one box. It is fully functional. Any place that you can have open flame, you can make yourself a pot of tea. First of all, we're going to talk about design. What is steampunk? What can we do with wood in steampunk? And what can you make out of wood for steampunk? Okay, when it comes to design, let's move over to this box. So what we have is we have a stove in here that is approximately six and a half by six and a half. Obviously, I can't make a five and a half in a five and a half inch box and fit a six and a half by six and a half inch object in it. But what do I want it to do? Well, I want it to be able to completely hide the stove so that it can close up. So right there, I'm already starting to dictate what size my box is going to be. All right? There's different ways you can do that. You can slide it in. You can hinge it up. That will cut down on some area. But the way that I approach it is, is that I either have a box for a purpose or a purpose for a box. That's these two examples. A box for a purpose. I want to be able to have a pot of tea anywhere I am. That's why you build a box like this. A purpose for a box. I have the faceplate out of a 1960s era jet fighter. What the hell am I going to do with it? Well, I'm going to put it into a box and I'm going to make it look like it came from the Royal Air Service in Britain. So that's how I approach all of my boxes. The star of my show has always been the bar box. Everybody loves the bar box. I want to go to conventions and I want to get hammered. So I built a box that is literally a portable bar. You take, you pour the drink in the funnel, it goes down into the mixing chamber, you open the needle valve and it dispenses the drink. It holds the jiggers, it holds the liquor, it holds all of the mixers, it holds everything. It's a big box, it's a heavy box. So. For, for boxes that I build, it's all dictated on what I want to do. Now, you also have to put in, is the box for a male or for a female? If the box is for a male, it can usually be a little heavier. It can usually be a little bulker. If it's for a female, it usually needs to be a little lighter weight. I use most often half-inch hardwood plywood for all of my boxes. The reason being is because it's fairly lightweight. It is unbelievably strong and it holds fasteners very well. Yes? Plywood, how many ply? Most import plywoods when you're talking about half inch are usually seven. Okay. okay, if you get up to three quarter, a lot of times that can go to 11 or 13, and the half inch, I very rarely ever have any kind of warpage on it. Three eighths will warp, quarter inch will warp. Yeah. If you try to build anything out of those, you're gonna have to keep it pretty small and you're gonna have to secure it very, very well. All right, so other than that for design, like I said, what you want the box to do or what you want to build the box around is gonna dictate the design. Now the steampunk part of it. This is where I kind of have people get upset with me. Steampunk is a look, it is an aesthetic. That is all it is. There are no rules, there are no laws, there are nothing that says something is or is not steampunk. Steampunk is an aesthetic that goes from approximately 1850 to 1910. 
as long as the box or whatever you're making, clothing, whatever, looks like it fits into that time period, congratulations, it's steampunk. It doesn't have to have gears. Does anybody see a gear on any of this? But that box was featured in just Steampunk Magazine. Okay, moving on. Materials. We've already talked a little bit about the materials. Like I said, I use plywood. Um, I like it as long as you don't go into the side of it. It's usually pretty good on holding the fasteners. If you go into the side, pre-drill your hole, put glue on the fastener, then drive it in. Remember, just like Particle Board, who here's bought furniture from Ikea, how many times do you have taken it apart, put it back together? About twice. And then it doesn't go up together anymore. Same thing with using the edge of plywood. You got about two times. Dry fit your stuff first, make the hole, put the screw in, hold it together if you have to, take the screw out. The next time the screw goes in, better be for your final assembly. It just does not have the, the power to hold fasteners over more than two applications to be safe. Pine. I like using pine. It's cheap, but I always cover it. Why do I cover pine? Does anybody know whether pine is a softwood or a hardwood? Soft. Correct. It's a softwood, meaning that it doesn't tolerate abuse. It will show every fingernail scrape. It will show every drop, every ding, everything that you can possibly do for it. Where is that a positive? Exactly. If you want to make a dis distress piece, make it out of pine, beat it, kick it, throw it. Then take wood stain and just gob the stain on it. You're going to be amazed at what shows up because that wood stain is going to pool in every single one of them little cracks, crevices, nicks, everything else that you made, and it's going to make the piece look old. If you want to paint the piece and make it look old, paint it first, get it all nice and pretty, then throw it around. Let the kids have it, let the dog chew on it, and then go back through. What I do if I want to make something look old painted, I will paint it with a primer, then I will put a base coat usually of red, then I will prime it again, then I'll put another coat of like black on it. Take a piece of sandpaper and sand it. Sand through the black, sand through the primer to the red. That gives you that aged, worn look. Remember that when you're aging your pieces, when people grab stuff, there's a reason that all around the handles is always dirty. It's because it's where their fingers and the oils from their fingers touch. That's the spots that you, that you dirty up. Think about it. Open that box about 20 times, all by yourself, and, and think about all the areas that you touched. Put ink on your fingers. Play with the box. Think of the areas that you touch. That's where you age the box. Uh, hardwood plywoods we've kind of discussed. Uh, solid hardwoods. I'm talking oak, maple, hickory, all of those. Absolutely beautiful woods. I mean, there is nothing. That box has, the tea box has oak in it. I love nothing more than to sand down a good piece of hardwood and then put stain on it and watch that wood come to life. Yes, I am a wood geek. I love watching it come to life, but they're hard to work with. It's rough on your saw blades. It, you'll get a quarter of the use out of a saw blade cut hardwoods that you will, softwoods. Uh, everything needs to be pre-drilled. You can't just drive a nail into hardwoods. Uh, it, I think it takes a little more level of woodworking to be able to work with hardwoods and, and use them effectively. But by all means, I suggest it, because you're never gonna learn until you try, play with them. But don't try to make a full-size box out of oak. One, it's gonna cost you an arm and a leg to do it. You know, oak on average is probably gonna run you anywhere from $3 to $9 a lineal foot. Uh, and, and it gets pricey quick. All right, any questions on wood choices? All right, am I going too fast? Yeah. It's actually a good hardwood <clears throat> that's not that hard, it's poplar, and that's a fun one to distress too because it's so soft, like a pine. You were talking it really about. is, yeah. It's not that Pop expensive. Poplar is a very good intermediate wood. Yes, it is classified as a hardwood, but it is much softer than an oak. It does take distressed very well. The only thing I will say about poplar is it does not stain well. It's green, and so it will always tinge stain green. 
But if you're gonna paint it, if you're gonna cover it with paper, as I do with a lot of boxes, you're gonna cover it with leather and you want something that's durable, easier to work with, and a little more cost effective than oak or one of those, but has more rugged characteristics to it than pine, yes, poplar's a great choice. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Tools, <laughs> my pet peeve. I love to see guys carrying 25 foot tape measures on their hip. What the hell are you gonna do with that thing? Right, your garage is at 25 feet across it. Why? I carry eight and 10. They'll fit in my pocket, they're easy to handle. The other thing is, is learn how to read it. There's an app called Tapulator. I love that app because it will take any measurement, you can add, you can subtract, you can divide, you can do anything you want to it, and it actually shows you on a tape measure what the answer is. So when I'm placing hinges, and I have nine inches across, I have a one inch hinge. I'm gonna put two of those in there. I take nine, subtract the two inches for the hinges, divide that by three, and the measurement it gives me will let me space those hinges out perfectly. And Tapulator does it in a heartbeat. It's an absolutely wonderful app. Uh, hammer, 16 ounce. Uh, most people will say that they, they want like a 24 ounce hammer. Okay, if you're framing a house, buy a 24 ounce hammer. If you're doing work around your house, normal work around the house, if you're doing just work out in your shop, 16 ounce is plenty. I have two, I have a 16 ounce, and then I also have a tack hammer. And the reason I have a tack hammer is because I drive a lot of tacks. Also, ball bean, ball bean hammers. I don't know if I address it in here, another one of my pet peeves. Do not hit rivets with a wood hammer. A wood hammer is not hardened, it's not designed to hit rivets. That's what a ball peen hammer is for. The other thing is, is that if you're doing a lot of work and you're using like wood chisels, stuff like that, go to Harbor Freight. Buy one of the little mallets that they have that has the plastic and rubber ends on them. It's gonna save your chisels. Any hand tools, I am, other than drills, uh, saws, saws all, any of that stuff, buy the corded ones. Do not waste your money on the rechargeable battery ones. And I'll tell you why. You're not a contractor. You're not going to be out there using that tool every day. The worst thing you can do for a rechargeable battery is to charge it, use it for 30 seconds, and then let it set. You're throwing money away if you buy the rechargeables. Buy the cord, learn to deal with the cord. It's not that difficult. Go out and buy yourself a contractor grade 18 volt or 22 volt contractor's grade drill driver. You will not regret that purpose, that, that purchase. They will last you your lifetime. They're lightweight. They have all the power in the world. You can't stop them. If you go out and you buy a cheap tool, if you're going to buy a cheap tool knowing that you're going to throw it away and you're going to buy another cheap tool, go ahead. But go out and spend two, three hundred dollars on a good drill driver. If you're building boxes like these, you're going to have that in your hand constantly. So it's worth it to spend the money on the proper tools. When it comes to um, table saw stuff like that, I have basic. I have a. I bought mine at Home Depot. It's I think it's an 18 inch, maybe 24 inch tabletop model. I bought my drill press at Harbor Freight for seventy nine dollars. Um, I bought my compound miter saw at uh, Home Depot or Lowe's for $119 on sale. I don't have jet tools. I don't have the, the Norm Abrams tool bin that a lot of people have. And yet I can still make very nice materials. But I take my time and I cut straight. Uh, straight edge, I can't, tell, I can't tell you enough. Invest in good straight edges. There's not a cut that you can't make with a skill saw that you can make with a table saw if you have a good straight edge. And I can't tell you when it comes to assembly, especially on boxes like this, having straight, square edges is utmost important. Now you can take a lot of this stuff and you can fill them, you can putty them, you can go through and you can put them on belt sanders and you can do all that, but that's just time that you could, you could have been building more stuff if you don't take the time to do that and cut it straight. Uh, drill bits, um, buy, buy the good kits. Uh, dull drill bits are terrible. You go to touch them to the wood, they wander all over. Um, 
go to Harbor Freight, I think for $3.99 you can buy a spring-loaded prick punch. The thing's friggin' awesome. You put your point on your piece of wood, you take it, you put it on there, and you push down, and it'll spring, and it'll drive, and it'll actually put a point, a little divot, into the wood. And then you can drill, and you don't have to worry about your drill bit wandering all over hell. It's a great $3.99 purchase. Uh, wood glue and super glue. I use Gorilla Glue. I use the Gorilla Super Glue and I use the Gorilla Wood Glue. They haven't failed me. Um, Elmer still works. I don't like the uh, Gorilla, the kind of brownish glue that they have that's water activated. Yeah, it foams and goes all over Hell's Half Acre. And, and it don't come off. It's a great glue, but it doesn't come off. Uh, the other thing I do is when I'm building, because all of my stuff is, is fairly small, is I dot super glue, and then I fill in in between those dots with wood glue. That gives me a workable surface in about a minute and a half. So as long as you're careful with it, you can start gluing and putting on the fabric or doing whatever you got to it while that wood glue is setting. So that's really sped up my production. I don't have to clamp stuff with wood glue on it, let it set overnight, then come back out and use it the next day. So use a combination of super glue and wood glue to hold your stuff together. Obviously, if you're building cutting boards, if you're building something that's big that's going to be exposed to water or something like that, do not do that. The other thing is, is that with a lot of my boxes, you can see that they're, that they're paper covered. I use the paper as actual, it's actually holding the wood together. Paper is very, very strong. Everybody take one of the pieces that you had like this and front it in your fingers like this and try to break it. It takes a lot of force to break it. It rips very easily, but to actually break the paper, it takes quite a bit of force. So if you take pieces of quarter inch and you take one sheet of paper and you put, lay it in there, you just put in a, an actual angle over every square inch of that that's going to help hold that wood together. I use that constantly. And if I'm doing something where I think it's going to be under a little bit of stress, I'll use thicker paper. I'll use like cardstock. And I've had stuff, I'll take any of the purses out there that I have. There's no mechanical fasteners that hold them together. I'll stand on them. I weigh 250 pounds. I'll stand on every one of them. And the, and the reason that they're so strong is because of that paper bond. Depending on what you're doing with your piece, it's usually easier to assemble it and then sand it and that way you're sure that you got a smooth surface than it is to spend way too much time pre-sanding. However, when you're doing tight areas like that, you must pre-sand before you assemble because you can't get in there with sandpaper to do it so that the stain will take evenly. Uh, oversize any pieces so you can sand, trim to fit. I usually oversize my stuff by anywhere from a 32nd to a 16th. I will take it over to the piece, put it on, make sure it fits. Then I'll take it back to the saw and I'll just buzz off that little extra bet. And it works great. I, it's cut down so much on my, I, because they haven't invented a good wood stretcher yet. They just don't have it. Exactly. You can, you know, it's like my mom used to say when baking, you know, you can always add more, but it's a son of a bee to get the salt or the pepper back out of it. So use that. Uh, do not over glue. <laughs> I've seen people put so much glue on stuff. It's like, God, please, please let me invest in the glue company that you buy from because you're wasting so much glue. It takes very little glue to, to hold the bond. Very little. Super glue. Remember the old commercial, we'll date ourselves. Remember the old commercial where the guy put the one little dot on his hard hat, stuck it to the I-beam and he hung there? You know, they made a bajillion dollars off of that commercial. And it's true, one dot of super glue holds. People come to me all the time and they ask me about glues and they'll go, I'm trying to super glue this gear on and it won't stay. Well, how much super, well, I just coat it in super glue. Well, no wonder it won't stay. It, does, it never has a chance to dry to a bond. It will dry, but it's gonna, it's gonna get a skin on it and never bond to material. Just take a little tiny bit, dab, 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 dab. Wood glue, if you clamp anything together, clamp it until you see the glue start to come out. Stop! 
Do not reef those clamps down. You're gonna squeeze all the glue out. Countersinking is very important. If you're gonna use screws, countersink your screws. Everybody know what I mean by that? And then you can buy, they have really good wood putties out now. If you're going to stain your piece, avoid wood putty, do not use it. It's gonna say stainable, it, they lie, it's not stainable. It never ever is stainable. If you want stainable filler, save all of your sawdust, all the little fine sawdust, mix it with Elmer's glue and your stain, and it will match. But do not put a white wood filler in there and think you're gonna go over that with mahogany stain, it's gonna take stain. Don't, it's gonna stay white. So fill those before you're, you're, you're done. If you're going to stain the piece, avoid screws unless you want them to be seen or sink them far enough that you can put in hardwood plugs. Bless your heart if you do it, it's a pain in the ass. It requires you to go in with a saw and cut them off, then you gotta sand them down, and then guess what? It's still not gonna take the, same, the stain the same way. It's still not gonna match. Everybody's gonna see the plugs and knew what you did. So find other ways to secure it if it's gonna, if it's gonna be seen. If you're doing a hardwood, find other ways to secure it. There are other ways. Sand clean, sand and clean, prior to staining, tap cloths work. They're 99 cents, people. Call me, I will send you a damn dollar. Buy a tack cloth. Once you use them, you will never ever be without them again. I buy them by the box. Painting, staining, polyurethane, whatever I do, it gets tack cloth before any finish goes on it. You cannot vacuum, wipe, dust, and dust the wood good enough to get all that dust off there. Tack cloths are actually filled, they used to be filled with pine pitch but now it's obviously synthetic and they're sticky. And so what you do is you rub the piece with that and it grabs every little piece of dust. It's like freaking magic, it's really cool. And then you can go through and polyurethane or stain. The other thing is, is make yourself a little paint booth. I made myself a paint booth. It's 36 inches wide, it's 24 inches tall, and it's 24 inches deep with a sloping back. I took a cheap shower rod put in front of it. I took a clear poly shower curtain, cut it up through, hooked it with the rings on it. I opened that up, I installed a bathroom fan on the back part of it. I take furnace filters and cut them down. That's what I use for my paint filters. And I turn it on and I spray in there and it's not really so much to get rid of the, the fumes and stuff like that because the bathroom fan really doesn't have enough oomph to do it. But when I close that curtain, I can go back and work in my shop and don't have to worry about the dust getting inside of my paint booth. The other thing is, is I work in a garage, my garage. Open that door up, I don't know what the hell it is with polyurethane, but little tiny bugs, are they love it. Yeah, they can't wait. Oh my God, he's polyurethane. Yes. And they come in swarms and they land on my stuff. You know? If, if you put that in a little closed off area, they're pretty stupid, they can't get in there. And, and it'll, it'll save you a lot of time and energy and sanding. Um, polyurethane question. Uh, you've put on your first coat of polyurethane. What do you then do? Let it dry. Let it dry. Okay, let it dry. Next. Sand. Sand with what? Steel wool. What kind of steel wool? Quadruple oct is what it's called. Do not ever, 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 ever touch polyurethane with sandpaper. Does, that's one reason. The other reason, does anybody know what it is? When you sand, it generates heat. Sandpaper generates an unbelievable amount of heat. It will soften the polyurethane. So always use quadruple oct steel wool. Then what are we gonna do? No, we're going to tack rag it. That's what we're going to do. Then we're going to polyurethane it again. The general rule of thumb, if it's something that's just going to be visual, visually seen, polyurethane, two to three coats is enough. If it's something that you're going to use for like a tabletop or something like that, if you're not putting on at least five to seven coats, don't even bother. Because you're not putting enough polyurethane on there to do any good. Does everybody know the difference between gloss, satin, and matte and what they're used for? Okay, 
when would I use a gloss? Anyone? Okay, very good. When would I use a mat? Anything that's going to be handled, do not put gloss on it. It will show every fingerprint. It will show every scuff, every scrape. The only time that you ever use gloss is if you're going to do a showpiece. It's going to be something that's going to be set up on the mantle and nobody's ever going to touch it. Or you're going to put on about 12 layers of it and it's going to be a durable, durable surface. And the only reason that you use gloss then is because that shows the depth. That's the whole reason you use gloss is because it shows the depth. Who wants to know a very, very cool trick to use with polyurethane, especially gloss? Nobody? Fine, I'll move on. All right, take a piece of wood, paint it flat black, put about two coats of flat black on it. Then take any kind of a stencil, preferably something feminine and soft, like a rose or something like that and then put about four coats of polyurethane over the top of that. When that piece dries and is fully finished, it will look like that rose is floating about an eighth inch off of the surface of that flat black. It is the coolest thing. But again, because it's gloss, it has to be, I would recommend that for dressers, for bedroom furniture, um, something like that. But it's a really, really cool trick and that was one that I picked up probably 20 years ago. Stains, finishing enclosures, um, I prefer to use the regular um, Minwax stains. Uh, I don't like gels. I've never liked them. Uh, I, use, I use just regular Minwax stains. I take an old nasty piece of fabric and I wad it up into like a little dauber thing and I dip it in there and I do and I don't wear freaking gloves. But, I, 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 and I just, I just cover it with everything. I, and I throw it off to the side. Well, you should put on, you know, a stain inhibitor or a stain evener and all that stuff. I've never seen the benefit. If you're going to use pine and you're going to try to stain it, why on God's green earth you do that, I don't know. But if you're going to try, okay, buy a primer sealer that you can put on it so that you can then stain over it. Um, other good things to think about for using if you're going to use pine or other softwoods for stains is to look at the ones that they have for decks and fences. They're called semi-transparent stains. That's uh, like Cabot is available last time I knew 74 different colors. And that really covers up and really evens out the differences in pine lumber and you can get a wood look to it. You can get aged cedar look. You, they have a aged cedar gray color that's very nice. Um, but that's what I would recommend. Um, but whatever stain you use, you make sure it's a good one. Don't, ch don't cheap out on that stuff because um, this is going to be the end result. This is what your product's going to look like when you set it in your home or you set it on your shelf for sale. This is what it's going to end up. This is not the stage to cheap out on stuff. Uh, paper. I use heavy scrapbook paper, Joann's, Hobby Lobby, all of those sell it. They sell it in a myriad of colors, patterns, designs. You can get it anywhere under the sun. Pleather. This box is covered in pleather. Uh, if anybody doesn't know what pleather is, it's fake leather. Uh, you can buy that. Again, Joann's, Hobby Lobby, all of those have it. Uh, it is about a third of the cost of real leather. The problem is, is that the backing of it a lot of them are very uh, fluffy, I guess is the best way to describe it. Yeah, and it's hard to get them to, to stick to the surface. Um, it, it does, yeah. So it, it's, it can be as easy to work with as leather, or it can be even more difficult to work as leather. So the thing that I'll say is I don't care what you put on your box because it's going to look awesome. I don't care what you put on there. But just bear in mind that unless your name is R.J. Foster, you're not going to be able to sell that item for the cost of that leather because you're not tooling it. You're not spending the hours that he spends on that material. The other thing is rivets. You'll notice on this box that I try to use historical fasteners whenever I can. Those are rivets. I will tell you my inside source for that is Ohio Travel Bag. 
They're an absolutely wonderful company. It's $39 for a minimum order. All of the rivets that you see here, all of the leather connectors, all of that stuff, all came from Ohio Travel Bag. Um, you know, people tell me not to give out my sources, but if you guys would go make something, you'd, you'd do my heart good. Again, closures are dictated by the piece. This closure, I hate the damn thing, but they're so readily available. And I don't know if they're called swing clasps, I don't know what they're called, but hell, you see them on corsets and everything else. They're sort of kind of period but it's better than like a draw hasp. You know, draw hasp, they didn't have draw hasp in Victorian times. Think outside the box, uh, come up with different things. Combine stuff that people don't combine. You know, people see the inside of my boxes and they see the different colored papers and everything else in there and they, they get all excited. You know, it's because I'm doing something different. It's not that I'm a rocket scientist. It's not that I've invented, you know, reinvented the wheel. It's because I've stepped outside of the norm. You know, put leather on the inside of your box. You know, if it's going to be used, if, for example, the tea box, if it's going to be used, think about it. Water's going to get spilled. What better surface to spill water on than leather? You know, wipes off, it's easy clean. You know, put, put vinyl on there. Um, the Titanic. Does anybody know what the most expensive square footage of the Titanic? Yes, sir. Linoleum. Correct. It was linoleum. The main staircase of the Titanic on that floor in front of it was covered in linoleum. It was ungodly expensive because it had just been invented. Does anybody know what year the Titanic sunk? Yes, sir. 1912. So we're just a titch outside of the Victorian era. Any quick questions? Yes. The care and maintenance of your primary tools. Yes. Your hands. Yeah. Yes. What do you do about when they start getting stiff and arthritis and all kinds of things go wrong with them? <laughs> I, I was going to say, I have a way I want to answer that, but I would just recommend exercise and heat. Yeah, yeah, cold, cold affects me terrible. Thank you so much, everybody, for being a great, attentive audience. I appreciate it. I hope you learned anything. If you need me, I am in the vending area all weekend. Please stop by, grab one of my cards. Don't ever, ever, ever question picking up the phone, calling me, or contacting me through email, my website, or anything like that. Again, thank you so much for your time.